Atheisten sind nicht sonderbar, sondern ganz normale Menschen, zum Beispiel Busfahrer, Lehrer oder der Kellner im Restaurant. Die meisten sind sogar äußerst nette Menschen. Treten Sie daher furchtlos näher, überwinden Sie Ihre Scheu vor dem Unbekannten und begleiten Sie mich auf die Reise. Willkommen an Bord! Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde der Richard Dawkins Foundation, mein Name ist Jörg Elbe von der Richard Dawkins Foundation in Deutschland. Ich freue mich, dass Sie an diesem Sonntag so zahlreich den Weg in die Urania gefunden haben. Über unsere beiden Gäste ließe sich abendfüllend Geschichten erzählen. Es hieße, die sprichwörtlichen Eulen nach Athen zu tragen, sie vorstellen zu wollen. Ich beschränke es dabei auf zwei kurze Anekdoten. Anlässlich eines Vortrags marschierte Michael Schirmer mit einer Wünschelrute über die Bühne, welche hin und wieder unvermittelt ausschlug. Dieses Präzisionsinstrument wurde in den USA Schulleitern für 900 Dollar Stückpreis angeboten, um damit Marihuana in den Schließfächern von Schülern aufzuspüren. Die entscheidende Frage ist hierbei natürlich, kann man mit der Wünschelrute tatsächlich Marihuana aufspüren? Die Antwort ist recht einfach, ja, wenn man ausreichend viele Schließfächer geöffnet hat. Im Frühjahr 2002 hielt Richard Dawkins einen Vortrag, der wie eine Zusammenfassung all dessen daherkommt, was in den nachfolgenden Jahren unter dem Begriff neuer Atheismus subsumiert werden sollte. Unter seinen Statements ist auch die Antwort auf die Frage, wie hat sie 9-11 verändert? Er erwiderte, nun, so hat es mich verändert. Lasst uns aufhören, so verdammt respektvoll zu sein. Um den Einfluss fundamentalistischer religiöser Stiftung in den USA etwas entgegenzusetzen, regte er an, eine säkulare Stiftung zu gründen und versprach, wenn sich seine Bücher genauso gut verkaufen würden die, wie die von Stephen Hawking, so würde er es selbst tun. 2006 konnte er diese Vision verwirklichen, der Großerfolg von The God Illusion 2007, auf Deutsch der Gotteswahn, ermöglichte die Gründung der Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Seit 2013 ist die Foundation mit einer deutschsprachigen Webseite vertreten. 
Wiewohl die Aktivitäten der Richard Dawkins Foundation mit den Jahren immer vielfältiger wurden, ist der Kern des Anliegens stets gleich geblieben. Er besteht in der Förderung naturwissenschaftlicher Bildung, kritischen Denkens und des auf Beweise gestützten Verständnisses der natürlichen Welt mit dem Ziel, religiösen Fundamentalismus, Aberglauben, Intoleranz und menschliches Leid zu überwinden. Unsere heutigen Gäste vertreten diese Anliegen wie keine zweiten. Es ist mir daher eine besondere Freude und Ehre, Sie heute hier begrüßen zu können. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Michael Schirmer and Richard Dawkins. Thank you for that uh, warm reception, especially, mostly for Richard, I suspect. Hang on. <laughs> But I'm glad to be here, too. <laughs> uh, so I thought, Richard, we might um, cover the span of uh, religion and science, and then uh, morality and science, and then maybe seg it a little bit into politics and it related to both terrorism, what's the real cause of it, religion, politics, both or whatever, and then maybe wrap up with some of the recent campus craziness about postmodernism and, and what's truth and, and that sort of thing. So uh, starting on a, a positive note, um, as, as you know, there's been a huge growth of the nuns, the so-called uh, 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 people that tick the box for no religious affiliation. Uh, you guys don't have this problem in, in, in Germany, but <laughs> you went through this already long ago. Uh, but in America, it's now about 25% uh, of all Americans have no religion, uh, about 33% of millennials, those born after 1981, and it, it could be close to 50% of iGeners, that is, kids born after 1995. So now, you're probably familiar with Stein's law that uh, trends that can't go on forever won't. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, at least in large part to your work and that of the atheist movement, can you foresee a day when, say, in England and in, in the United States, when we could get to 80%, 90% nuns? And, and also we should distinguish that, that when they tick the box for no religious affiliation, that doesn't necessarily mean they're atheists. That's true. They may be followers of Deepak Chopra, yeah. or uh, you know, they, they think there's a force in the universe or the secret, and they just have to ask. Yeah. The There's got to be something out There's there. There's something, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, I think in German you probably don't have the same problem that we have with none being confused with none. <laughs> uh, I, I have a friend who, who was in hospital and uh, she was in bed and a nurse was taking down her particulars and you have to write down everything and the, the nurse said religion, so she said none. <laughs> and... Um, Then later, when she was in bed, she overheard two of the nurses gossiping about her, and one of them said, she doesn't look like a nun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um, we're on the right track, obviously, even in, in America. Um, in Britain, we're going, get, getting there. I think Scandinavia are getting there. Um, in Germany, I think pretty good. Um, there, there's still... Uh, a, a, a nominal loyalty in Germany, I think, to either Catholic or Lutheran church, so much so that they actually pay taxes. Um, yes. Not just in general, but you pay a tax to... A, I, stop me if I got this wrong. <laughs> it seems hard to believe. It, <laughs> once, once you're baptized as, say, either Catholic or Lutheran, then you have to pay tax to that church unless you actually go and pay money in order to disassociate yourself <laughs> from that church. Yeah, yeah it's a... It, it's That's got to be something wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually uh, withheld from your paycheck, just like in America's Social Security and, and your health care and, and whatever is, is taken out of your paycheck. You never even see the money, which, by the way, was why Scientology tried to get in 
Germany in the 90s as a major religion so they could get in on that withholding thing. Uh, and that's why the Germans, who had some experience with fringe cults in the past, uh, said, no, no, <laughs> Scientology is not a major religion. But by the way, the humanists, if I recall, the German humanists, they, they get some state support as a sort of quasi-religion. Now, it's, what, hard, yeah. Yeah. it's hard to know how you would define what's a true religion. I mean, right. I, and I imagine that was the point about the flying spaghetti monster, was to, was to raise awareness of the, of the absurdity of having a, a legal definition of what is a proper religion. Well, particularly Scientology is an interesting test case because in the 90s when the internet started to take off, uh, ex-members were posting their secret documents online, which was a new thing, and you know, this was like, oh my god, I can read about Xenu, the galactic warrior, uh, you know, and, and, and all that crazy stuff. The church actually got judges to give uh, search warrants to go in and take people's computers, their hard drives, their floppy disks, <laughs> is what they had at the time, uh, and, and confiscate them because it was proprietary, copyrighted material, almost like you stole the script for Harry Potter before it was broadcast or something like that, which would imply that they made it up, <laughs> right? It's a, it's because if you copyright it, then you just made it up. There was a there was a, a another story. Uh, there was a you probably know this woman Jay Z Knight who channels Ramtha, the thirty five thousand year old warrior. Uh, no, I don't. Oh yes, so Jay Z Knight. She's from Seattle, Washington, and she was an actress. There's a little background for you. So uh, she, all of a sudden, she started getting these visions from Ramtha, who was this 35,000-year-old warrior okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> who spoke English with an Indian accent. Yes, yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Where that was 35,000 years ago, it's not clear. But then a German woman started channeling Ramtha. And Jay-Z Knight said, oh, no, 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 no. I own Ramtha. It's like. <laughs> copyright. Uh, yeah, copyright. Yeah. Which, you know, if she, if she won that case, I forget how it turned out now, I think she lost the case, but if she won the case, it would imply, well, you just made it up then. Yeah. Well, I've always wondered about the Book of Mormon being written in the 19th century, but written in the style of 15th century English. <laughs> yes, I mean, what's right. that about? It, it, <laughs> right. You'd have thought that would have given the game away right away that he's a charlatan. Yeah. As if the fact that he, wasn't, that he was convicted of fraud earlier in his life wasn't enough. If you've, if you've never read John Krakauer's book, Under the Banner of Heaven, okay. he's, first of all, he's a great writer. He's the guy that wrote uh, Into the Wild and In the Thin Air about, climb. he's a climber. Uh, then he got into the, uh, he wrote a, a piece for, I think, Vanity Fair Atlantic on uh, this uh, multiple shooting of a, uh, of a polygamist family. There was a m murder there. And then that led him into the whole polygamy world, which is illegal since 19, 1896. But they do it anyway in these, uh, border states between Colorado and Arizona and Utah there in these little towns where they marry one woman and then the others are sister wives. Um, and so he delved into that, into the history of when Joseph Smith got the revelation from God, he already was having an affair with this woman down the street. So he comes home to his wife, I forget what her name is now, but you know, honey, I've been talking to God. <laughs> And you're not going to believe what he said. You know, you know our friend down the street? Well, I have to marry her, too. <laughs> and, of course, she was, you know, as you would expect, livid about this. Well, then I'm going to take multiple husbands. <laughs> no, you know, God was really clear about this. <laughs> it's, it's a guy thing. And, and, and all my friends were there. They heard it, too. They couldn't believe it either. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it stuck until uh, Utah wanted to become a state in, in 1896 a part of the United States, and the government said, you can't have this polygamy thing. And they got a new revelation from God who said, I've changed my mind <laughs> about the, it's back to monogamy. And then the same thing, they got a revelation in the 1970s about, uh, about African-Americans. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it really shows the, you know, the cultural boundaries. Mm -hmm. one, one, uh, one, one funny little uh, personal story. My wife is from Cologne, Germany. Well, Cologne, I don't have to say. <laughs> In America, you have to say that anyway. Uh, <laughs> So when she met, she was pretty much an atheist by then. That was five years ago. And she uh, then decided to opt out of the withholding thing. And she had to go down to the courthouse, fill out the paperwork, file a little fee to pay for that. And, and she, wore her, she wore a black T-shirt that said, 
Dawkins, Dennett, Harrison Hitchens. Of course, they didn't get it, but, you know, <laughs> but I thought it was pretty delightful. But then they told her, okay, now, uh, just to make sure that's clear, you can't like get married in the Catholic Church the moment you sign this. Says, yep, that's fine. And then you can't do this and that, that's fine. But it takes us a while to process the paperwork, so we're going to withhold three more months out of your paycheck. <laughs> And she's like, wait a minute, in a business contract, when it ceases, it ceases for both parties. Well, not this one. <laughs> well, let's have a big movement here. Everybody go to their church <laughs> yeah. tomorrow uh, and get a... Is well, it a courthouse, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a government thing. Y yes, it's you have to get excommunicated form. in the case of Catholics, I think. I know I've signed a number of excommunication certificates. People <laughs> come to me and, and said... <laughs> <laughs> So, if anybody wants me to sign their excommunication certificate after this meeting, I would be only too delighted to do so. <laughs> I'm curious how you answer the question that I always get, of what would it take, Shermer, for you to believe in God? I mean, I was once a believer, then I became an atheist. Uh, I didn't believe for really good reasons then, but now, you know, being a science guy, what's the evidence that would present to you that you would go, you know what, I was, I was wrong. I, I think there is a God. And, and so when you go through the things like, well, a miracle happens here on stage, the woman's cut in half or whatever, we, we've all seen Penn and Teller do this kind of, kind of thing. So I can't imagine anything that would happen that I could not imagine also was a trick or an illusion, or I, I misperceived, or something like that? I think that really, really good conjuring tricks are actually quite philosophically worrying from this point of view, because it is, I used to think, well, God would only have to appear, you know, with a great deep Paul Robeson type voice and say, I exist, and, and um, maybe trailing clouds of glory, and, but, I mean, have you ever seen a really good conjuring trick? It's, it's very easy to be fooled. Or a hallucination. Um, it is hard. Carl Sagan had an interesting notion um, in his science fiction book, Contact, where at the end, the heroine, Ellie, calculated the constant pi out to the umpteenth decimal place. And she expressed it in binary. And at some point, way, way, way out in the, in, in the Tr trillion quadrillionth decimal place, or rather binary place, of the constant pi, the, the digits fell into a, a square matrix with nothing but zeros except there was a circle of ones bisected by a diameter of ones. And this was God's signature woven into the very fabric of mathematics. Well, that would be good. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Of course, it wouldn't happen. Um, I, actually, maybe it would happen. If, I mean, if pi goes on indefinitely, maybe there would have to be somewhere where... Um, yeah, and I think that was Carl's way of, of, like with the SETI program, what would constitute a yeah. signal of intelligent design? A pulsar is not going to give prime numbers, for example. No. Although, yes, the, a pulsar wouldn't. You know the story of um, periodical cicadas do it giving prime numbers? Oh, yeah. You, that's um, right. You wrote about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not that it's intelligent life, but it, at least it's, it's not... It, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a way in which prime numbers could be generated. Periodical cicadas are insects which for, have plague years. They, they breed every either, I think it's every, either 13 or 17 years. Different races of them breed either 13 or 17 years, and these are prime numbers, and it's rather odd that they should come out every 13 years or every 17 years. They, they lurk underground for 13 years, and then suddenly they all come out together, in, 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 all in one burst. And then 13 years later, they all come out at, at the same time, except the other species come out every 17 years. And the theory is that they're running an evolutionary arms race with their predators, and the predators could be naturally selected to synchronize their breeding cycles with the prey breeding cycles. So if you choose a time, a time cycle, anything other than a prime number, it's possible for natural selection to favor the predators that synchronize with it. And so the idea is that in the arms race, they gradually got lengthened their stride until they hit a prime number that, um, that mm. uh, the predators couldn't match. 
Well, that is at least a one way in which you can get prime numbers out of pure nature without a mathematician having to write them down. Um, and the, the, the point about it, as, as Michael was saying, pr prime numbers might be, would, would be a very good way for an extraterrestrial intelligence to broadcast to the universe its existence. Because the theory goes you, that there's, there's only one way for prime numbers to be generated, and that's through intelligence. And the point about the cicadas is, is only that there is another way in which it, in which right. it could happen. From the bottom up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, on the same sort of category of, uh, of thinking about this in terms of the far future of humanity or if we encountered extraterrestrial intelligences, the point uh, that SETI people make is they're not going to be, first of all, they're not going to be bipedal primates with gnarly stuff on their forehead speaking English, <laughs> like in Star Trek. Uh, and they're not going to be just five years ahead of us technologically, like at Roswell, where they you know, back engineered uh, silicon chips or something like that. This was the best aliens could do. Um, they, you know, they'd be millions of years ahead of us. So if you, if you just take you know, Moore's Law for anything and extrapolate it out and look how far we've come in just a half century or a century or so of technology, they'd be like a million years ahead of us. Pretty much they could do anything we would call the, God. They would have to be because, in order to get here because it would right. be so difficult to get here. When, when I was about six, I, I wrote a, a science fiction story called Bobo Goes to the Moon. It was, <laughs> it was about a dog that went to the moon and I had enough sense to realize that the, the people on the moon wouldn't speak English. So I made them speak French instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a geologist, quite a well-known geologist called Simon Conway Morris, who does believe that we could expect them to be humanoid. Um, he's oh, very right. impressed by the power of convergent evolution. And there are numerous examples around the animal kingdom of animals that come from different starting points in evolution and converge on the same end point because it's a very good way to be for a certain way of life. And he's Im sufficiently impressed by that to think that we should not be over surprised if the unimaginative science fiction plot came true and they really were humanoid, not speaking English or French, but at least bipedal uh, with perhaps eyes pointing forward, big brain, um, I'm a bit skeptical of that, although he, did, he, I mean, I'm second only to Simon Conway Morris in my admiration for convergent evolution. He rather spoils it by dragging God in. I think he's got a bit of an agenda there. He, 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 he wants there to be alien life that is, that is humanoid for some kind of theological reason, I suspect. I think so. I think he also argued that there is probably not extraterrestrial intelligence uh, of our capability. Oh yes, I didn't know. I, I, didn't I think, I think yeah. that's right. Mm. But yeah, because if, if that were true, then of the you know, billions of species that have evolved on Earth, how come only one lineage ended up as bipedal primates? And we're the last one standing. Well, I mean, sh shouldn't have it happened you know, dozens one, of hundreds One has of to be first, I suppose. One has to be first, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. And then once one has, is first, it might stop all the others. Um, also, it's not obvious that, that it's an, an ideal way of life. There are plenty of other very good ways of life uh, other than being intelligent. <laughs> we know that well in America. <laughs> I forbore to remark on that. <laughs> he who will not be mentioned tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, the, but the point is that how would you know it was God if you encountered somebody who was capable of genetically engineering cells or uh, engineering planets, pl planetary systems or something like this? These are just advanced uh, problems to be solved yes. with technology and yes. any sufficiently advanced technology. I've started to come around to that yeah. view. I, I yeah. used to think it would be an easy, an easy point to, to, to demonstrate for God to demonstrate his existence, but miracles are not that impressive when you compare them with even earthly conjuring tricks, let alone the tricks that highly advanced civilizations of the kind that are capable, that, that if we were ever visited, as you said, they would have to be so hugely more advanced than us that they would appear to be godlike. Um, some people try to say from that, well, that means you sort of do believe in God because you do believe that there are right. extra. But there's a huge difference between a a highly advanced 
creative intelligence which has evolved by gradual slow steps, which is what would be the case for an extraterrestrial intelligence, and one that was there from the origin of the universe and created the universe. There's every difference in the world between, between those two. And some people can't see that, that distinction. It's a hugely important distinction. By the way, parenthetically, do you have an, uh, an opinion on the Fermi paradox? Uh, where is everybody if life is well, abundant? Well, where is everybody? Um, I'm not at all surprised we've never been visited because actually visiting bodily is such a... I mean, why would they bother to come here, for one thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right. But why haven't we picked up radio transmission? That is more of a, more of a puzzle. Um, the statistical calculation that leads one to suspect there is extraterrestrial life um, is based upon the huge number of stars and therefore planets, as we now know that all, well, virtually all stars have planets. Um, so that's a, a strong statistical argument. On the other hand, it is conceivable that the origin of life on a planet is such a stupendously improbable event that it has only happened once. And if that were the case, then it would have to be here, because here we are. <laughs> um, so there's, there's, that's not, I mean, it, it's, it's not demonstrable that, that we are accompanied by other life forms. Um, then again, you could say, well, it could be a very improbable, but not utterly improbable event. So there may be only a matter of a few billion life forms in the, in the universe. Well, a few billion is very few. It's a very small number compared to the 10 to the 22 possible, possible places. So that the life forms that have evolved out there could be so spaced out right. that they never encounter one another, even by radio. Um, I think it would be enormously exciting if SETI were to pick up intelligent signals. Of course, the evolution of intelligent life is another step beyond the evolution of life at all. It could be that life has evolved, has originated bacterial life, something like bacterial life has originated many times, but only very, on very few occasions has it broken through to perhaps multicellular life or perhaps um, intelligent life capable of of broadcasting signals such as we might you, pick up. You could get all the way to Neanderthals and have us go extinct and they survive. Yes. And we, there's, there's no indication that they yes. were proceeding along toward... And then we've only been capable of it for a century or so. Right. And so um, our, our signals have, are, are expanding in a, in a bubble which is not yet has, that doesn't yet have a very large radius. Um, it's been suggested that once a civilization reaches a sufficient technical level to produce um, high energy radio, then they also are capable of destroying themselves. Right. And so it might be that um, we have, uh, that they're all over the universe, there are little, little sparks of intelligent life coming into existence and then Going snuffing out. themselves out almost immediately. Which um, is why we have to colonize Mars, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm yeah. not going. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a one-way trip for stars, yes, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now, back to, to, to the, uh, the... We're talking here about generic gods. Uh, back to the Christian god, or the monotheism god, our late friend Vic Stanger made the point that um, we don't even have to make this argument. If that god exists, the universe should show certain features, and it doesn't. And therefore, we can kind of disprove the hypothesis. Well, you know, disprove a hypothesis. The hypothesis has not been proved because here are the characteristics it would have to meet, and it doesn't meet those. You mean that the universe should be more friendly? More friendly. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem of evil is the biggest one. Yes. If God's all powerful and all knowing. Well, and all yeah, that, but yeah. there's no reason why it shouldn't be an evil God. I mean, it, 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 you, you, no reason to assume that God has to be good. Y well, yes, but the Christian God. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Christian God. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one. Yeah, so good that he had to have his son crucified in order to, to forgive the rest of us. Because he loved us. <laughs> yes, I've been trying out a new argument with Christians uh, who absolutely must believe in the resurrection or else why would you be a Christian? So it had to happen. Why do you think it happened? They give the arguments. And, so, and then I say, okay, why don't the Jews accept those arguments? 
Now, you can't say because they, they believe they're on God. They believe the same God as you. They even believe the same book, at least the old part of it. <laughs> and they even, Jews even believe there will be a Messiah. He just hasn't come yet. So they're, they're that far with you. They know the arguments. You can't say they don't understand the arguments. These are learned rabbis have been studying this for 2,000 years. Why don't they accept it? And I, I never get a good answer other than, no. well, I'm praying for them or something like that. <laughs> Um, but by way of background, to, to seg into a, a related question about truth, um, last year I did a podcast with Joe Rogan on, uh, the, it was ostensibly about a, a ancient archaeology, who built the pyramids, that sort of thing, with a fellow named Graham Hancock. Uh, now, he doesn't believe ancient aliens came here and built the pyramids, but he thinks there was a civilization that lived 20,000 to 30,000 years ago that built them, and they're much older than archaeologists think. So this is sort of alternative archaeology category of which there are many, but he's that particular one. Anyway, so he's kind of an interesting character and he's really into altered states of consciousness, particularly the ones you do artificially. So, Oh, I've got him. Yeah, he, people keep trying to get me to take drugs with him. Is, that, is, is that's that? it. Yeah. <laughs> so last I don't know, about six months ago, he wrote to Richard and I and, and in, invited us to oh, go yeah. to Costa Rica where there is this uh, resort, it's a nice place. I mean, first class tickets, you know, stay at the resort for free, f free food, yoga, you know, it's great, massages, everything you want, but you gotta do ayahuasca every day for five days. Now, I didn't know much about ayahuasca, so I read up on it and, and I stopped at the, you vomit for four hours every day uh, because it purges the negative energy and the bad things that happen in your life, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so. <laughs> But the reason he, he wants us to do this is because most people that take ayahuasca come back convinced that there is this other world, this spirit world, this other dimension, this, the doors of perception are opened through the ayahuasca. It's a, it's a way of engaging your brain with this other world. And then we would come back and go, we were wrong. Not that we're Christians, but that we now know there is this other and world. And we win the Templeton Prize. And we could say we could win, yeah. that's right, we could win the Templeton Prize. Yeah. So let's say we did that, and unlikely, but let's say it happened, and we were convinced. And I write one of my Scientific American columns. I was wrong. There's this, and you write in one of your books. I discovered the spirit world. Why should our readers, or any scientist, or anybody with a brain, uh, <laughs> think that there's a good argument there? Well, because we're hallucinating, we're, we're, I mean, a subjective argument like that is no kind of argument. You've got to have an objective argument. It sounds a bit similar to Michael Persinger's um, helmet, which I think you've tried as well. well yes. This is a, a Canadian neurologist who has a rather interesting um, piece of uh, research that he does. He puts a, a modified motorcycle helmet on your head, and you sit in total darkness, and he passes magnetic field through your brain, and um, with about 80% of people, they have a religious experience of some sort. They, um, if they're Catholic, they tend to see Virgin Marys. If they're, um, it depends what their religion is. They, they, if they're people like us, they tend to feel at one with the universe and, and uh, things like that. And I was rather looking forward to, to, to that. I was rather hoping to feel this sense of great spiritual oneness with the distant um, un universe and with everything. Uh, nothing happened with me at all, unfortunately. Um, they had, this was all done for a BBC television documentary. And the BBC made a kind of gesture towards science by having a control, which was one vicar uh, <laughs> who um, also underwent the same experience. And he also reported that no kind of spiritual experience. However, Dr. Persinger believes he was lying because Persinger also monitored the electroencephalogram, the EEG waves of the mm. brain at the same time. And the EEG waves of one of the 80% susceptible people look different from the EEG waves of one of the 20% non-susceptible. And I showed the standard EEG waves of the 20% non-susceptible. The vicar was right up at the extreme susceptible end, but yet he was denying that he, he got anything. Instead, he filled his brain with something. It might have been reciting the multiplication table or something, desperately trying to shut out the 
spiritual awareness which Persinger's magnetic helmet was inducing. Not quite sure why a vicar would want to do that, actually. <laughs> Maybe something about not wanting to admit that his spirituality was influenced by brain states? Do you think that's plausible? That I don't know. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, Persinger, he, he kind of plays fast and loose with the interpretations of these experiences. Does he? Yes. I had, I had some experiences in there. I felt like I kind of left my body a little bit. Uh, there's a video on, on YouTube. You can well, just type Shermer, comma, out-of-body experiences. And I felt like a few things happened. But on the other hand, I've also done sensory deprivation tanks. You know, the, it's a big thing in California. Uh, you lay in these uh, uh, warm salt water. And so, so you, you're just floating there. And they close the lid so it's dark and it's quiet and so you're basically getting no sensory stimulation and then your brain after about an hour starts producing stuff and uh, you know light hallucinations just kind of fun stuff drug free and legal and uh, uh, I couldn't tell the difference between what Persinger was doing and, and, and just doing that so you are in total darkness yeah so it, it, yeah that's right so um, I think he needs better controls for that but uh, I do like what he's doing in, in the sense he's looking for some natural explanation for a, an apparently paranormal phenomenon. So to that extent, I, I use that as an example as well, that there's no such thing as the supernatural, the paranormal. There's just the natural, the normal, and stuff we haven't explained yet with natural means. So for example, if Deepak's favorite theory about consciousness, quantum consciousness, you probably know Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose's theory about the quantum states inside the microtubules and neurons. And these quantum states, when, neuron, when you have a thought, the neurons fire in a particular sequence, and this causes the quantum state to, to, to go across the, the distance, whatever it is, like the spooky action at a distance with quantum experiments, and it affects the quantum states in your brain. It causes your neurons to fire in the same pattern as mine, and we can read each other's minds. Okay, this is all bullshit, but it, let's say it turned out to be true. That would no longer be ESP. That would just be the, yeah, physics sure. or neuroscience or whatever. Yes, yeah. Just better, better science or, dif or dif different science. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you something, yeah. Michael? Um, I'm a, about the moral arc, which is just printed in German. Is that, is that, that right? It's just being. Yep, just um, right, yeah. You perceive a, um, an increase in moral sense as history goes by. We're getting better. We've, we've abolished slavery. We, we, we have a better attitude towards towards um, kindness and towards women and everything. Um, and I have called this, I think it's the same as what I've called the shifting moral zeitgeist. In both cases, we notice that as the centuries go by, um, things that in past centuries were regarded as intolerably um, reactionary. And I mean, if you, if you look back, I, I'm fond of looking back just to the 19th century where um, Darwin and Huxley and Abraham Lincoln were right in the forefront of advanced liberal moral right-on values. Yet they were, by today's standards, incorrigibly racist. Um, I mean, you know, Link Lincoln freed the slaves, but nevertheless he, he made speeches in which he said, that of course, obviously no, nobody but an idiot would think that black people are the equal of white people and they should ever be given the vote and all that kind of thing. And Huxley said similar things, although he was right in the vanguard of advanced mm -hmm. thought. You can pretty much label any writer by simply uh, look, looking at his moral values and saying, right, he must have lived in the 1920s right. or the 1940s or whatever. We change it as an astonishingly rapid rate. Um, and you've, I think, compared it to the Flynn effect, which is rather different, but the Flynn effect is um, the increase in measured IQ during the 20th century, decade by decade, there's a really substantial increase in IQ. So it has to be standardized so that the, the, the mean is 100, is 100 but you, you can do, do that. And, and it looks as though IQ really does, in, measured IQ really does increase in the same kind of way as the shifting moral zeitgeist. And I think it's empirically obviously true that it happens. What I'm less clear about is 
actually, as with the Flynn effect, as with the Flynn IQ effect, the moral Flynn effect, the, the shifting moral zeitgeist or the moral arc, um, in both cases, it's mysterious what's causing it. Yeah. Yeah, so Picker first uh, floated that idea in uh, Better Angels of Our Nature. Because in the Flynn effect, the, it, it's not just that the overall IQ score is going up. It's in particular in the abstract reasoning portions of the test. So things like arithmetic, vocabulary, th they haven't gone up much. It's the, you know, you take a three-dimensional figure and you rotate it in space three times, and then you, pick it, you have to pick the one down here that would match what it would look like. Those are the ones I can't do, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you kids stay in school because we're going to need you. <laughs> yeah. Getting smarter three points every, every decade. So, and, so then the, the jump that is arguable, I suppose, debatable, is to reason morally, it requires that kind of abstract rotation. I have to put myself in your head to imagine how you would see the world uh, and, and to then employ something like the, the, the golden rule. How, how would Richard feel if I did this uh, to, to him? How would I feel if this, he did this to me? Well, okay, that requires this constant shifting back and forth. So there's some evidence. When I wrote this in 2015, th these studies hadn't been replicated. A couple of them have now, where people who read uh, literature, uh, novels, uh, good novels, not, not, not people magazine type, you know, trash novels, but good novels, you know, Jane Austen kind of stuff. Uh, they score higher on uh, these ta uh, mind reading tasks. So you show people uh, pictures of people's faces and say, what, what is this person feeling? And people em that- Empathy test. Empathy test, yes. yeah. So people that read a lot score higher on those. So the, the interpretation is, is that Reading novels helps train the brain for you to see what the world looks like through another character's eyes. And therefore to be more moral. Yeah, that, that's the idea. Uh, we have it on the authority of Donald Trump's ghostwriter that he's never read a book in his adult <laughs> life. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> his book, <laughs> yes. He didn't even write it, let alone read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we weren't going to mention it, but oh, okay, it's sorry. on the table. Okay, it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. We deal with this every hour now in America. Yeah. At first, it was like once a month, something crazy would happen. Then it was once a week. Then it was once a day. Now it's pretty much every hour. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I uh, again, like with, I agree with Pinker. There's nothing inevitable about it. The whole thing could be reversed. Uh, not likely on the big things. It's not like slavery is going to come back uh, legally. Uh, there is slave trade, you know, s slave labor and, and, and the sex trafficking and that sort of thing, which is a kind of slavery, but it's not legal. And it happens in countries with crappy governments that can't enforce the laws against slavery. Um, and, you know, it's not like women are going to lose the vote now that they have in every country, including Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I think those big ones will continue. I think the little setbacks are like, you know, populism, white nationalism, uh, authoritarianism, some of those, we have to think of as three steps forward, two temporary back. Temporary blips, yes. Yeah, temporary, I, I, yeah. I think, I hope. Um, but looking at the big picture and the, and the, the shifting moral zeitgeist as, as it goes on from century to century, um, or decade to decade, actually, um, I'm not clear what it's about. I think it's a kind of complicated mixture, a bit more like Moore's Law, which seems to be empirically, it seems to be empirically the case that Computer power, as measured in, by various measures, increases at a fairly fixed, at a very fixed rate, actually, e exponentially. A du the doubling time of about 18 months, I think. Um, but it's not, it doesn't have one cause. It seems to be a complicated feeding in yeah. of lots of different causes. And I suspect that's the case with the shifting moral zeitgeist as well, that um, it's a sort of general something in the air, to, not, not to sound mystical, but uh, dinner party conversations, conversations in pubs, um, uh, legal decisions, parliamentary decisions, um, television, journalism, books, all these things in a rather heterogeneous way combine to cause a continuous, with occasional blips, shift in the, in the same direction. We're getting better. Yeah, you had some examples. I think it was in the God Delusion you talked about that, right? Probably, uh, the, the, yes. lang the language shift. Yes. So we, we can kind of see how that happens right now because we're going through this with this whole gender pronoun business. 
uh, where if I say I want to be called a Z or a Zer or whatever, um, and, and I'm asking you to do that, and, and then maybe the next time you write a book, you'll you'll say you know Shermer he oop, Z, yes, you know. So uh, now there's a difference between like you and me just having a conversation about it, but then it, you see how it spreads. All of a sudden, it's across college campuses. Yeah. In part, the Jordan Peterson phenomenon is driven by the fact that he stood up and said, no, I'm not gonna do that. And that was pretty controversial because before that, this is just kind of what we do. You know, when people say, I don't wanna be called that anymore. Like, I, yes, I think he said uh, that as a matter of courtesy, he would have no objection that, to doing that's it. That's right, yes, the government forcing. to being compelled to do it. Right, which, which, right. Which so do I, I mean, so, I must say. <laughs> yeah, because the, like, like when we were first younger, uh, when we were young, <laughs> uh, you know, when the, the, the his or her thing, you know, and you kind of clumsily go through, and I guess now it's acceptable to say they when you're referring to the singular. Maybe uh, I'm still uncomfortable doing that, but apparently that's grammatically acceptable now. That all happened without any government top-down regulation. People just... That's what I mean by something yeah, in the air. Yeah, and, and yes. That, and, and, that, that does happen. But, I, I, but you see it through, like, comedians, they'll use... Black comedians will use the N-word. I never would. Yes. And, and I think most white comedians don't now. Yes. And, and we've seen how that kind of just evolved. Just people, just 1,000, 10,000 conversations a day in which that comes up and you say, I'm not going to use that word. And that's how it happens. Yes. I, I don't like the, the his or her, him, him or his. I, I prefer to use she because I'm male. I think there's something rather gracious about using the opposite sex to your to your own, but pro probably that treads on somebody's corns. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so I guess there's always this tension between: uh, do we drive it from the bottom up? Like, how do we spread atheism? Um, well, we just have a, a th ten thousand conversations. Uh, versus, you know, we're going to pass laws. Well, we need laws about discrimination, probably. Yes. Uh, but not like what you call people. No. No, you can't legislate about, about how you use language. Remember the brights? Yes. The, the, this was an attempt to change the word from atheism to bright. I don't know if you, any of you remember this, but uh, it didn't go anywhere because it was pretty clear to most people that if, 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 if the opposite of the bright are the dims, and, and those are the people that believe in God, which we thought was funny because, <laughs> well... <laughs> Dan Dennett suggested that the opposite of, of a, since the de definition of a bright was somebody who did not believe in the supernatural, that the flattering way to describe those who do was call them supers, and they never super might be called a super. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I guess the problem is, is you can't just by fiat say, this is the word we're going to use. It just happens. Like, how did 9-11 start getting used? I have no, I don't think anybody knows. It just started getting used. That's right, and it's used all over the world. Even it's only in in America that the month goes before the day, right? So it, it should uh, be yes. eleven nine. Um, that's right. That's right. In the rest of the world, but we've all adopted nine eleven. Yeah, that's right. Another example of a bottom up change. Yeah. So I th I think we're getting there. It's fun to speculate in the long term future. I just wrote an article on colonizing Mars. What kind of government? You know, Elon says we're going to Mars. Okay, we're going to Mars. What kind of government are you going to set up there? So I tweeted at him just for fun, and amazingly he tweeted back saying, oh, we don't have to worry about government, just, just, just straight uh, uh, democracy, and it just everybody votes, and then it's going to be fine. It's like, N no, we already went through all this centuries ago. <laughs> and, you know, just, uh, you know, a, a, a you know, one-to-one -one democracy like that just doesn't, you know, mob rule and so on. Anyway, uh, but it's fun to speculate about, uh, at the end of the moral arc, I speculate about the demo eventual demise or falling away of the nation state as a concept. And we'll get back to city states. And, and just as that book hit the press, then Trump and authoritarianism and nationalism and, you know, the, the nation now is back as a, as a big thing which can be discouraging. You're kind of a globalist, right? A what, sorry? A globalist. Well, I hate the idea of nation states. I mean, I, I, I hate to make America great again. Um, we want to make the world great again. We want, we want to make, um, make the whole of humanity great rather than, than be loyal to what on earth is so good about a nation? I mean, we've been through that, as you say, and look where that got us. Right, but the ca <laughs> absolutely.
but their counter to, let's say, steel man, the other side argument, uh, that maybe we'll find some sympathy with if we just open the borders and let everybody in and then the terrorists come in. Uh, we don't live in a global world where, you know, th 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 that, that everyone can just get along. There are still bad, evil people that we have to have walls against. Yeah. Uh, that is a worry, I mean. I mean, um, a Angela Merkel does a moral thing by opening the borders to people that are oppressed from an authoritarian regime and then she gets hammered for this. I was talking to a young woman yesterday who is an ex-Muslim apostate now living in Germany and she gets persecuted and threatened by fellow refugees from Islamic countries who have come into Germany and want to live in Germany, want to presumably ought to be accepting a German way of life and yet they're persecuting a fellow refugee from an Islamic country because she doesn't follow their stinking religion. Do you sometimes feel like our tribalism is so deep in our DNA, both literally and metaphorically, uh, that it's gonna be almost impossible to break out of that, either politically or religiously, there's always gonna be these kind of tribal conflicts? I was having a meeting with Steven Pinker just yesterday and he reminded me of a, something which I find totally hard to believe, which is that people's attitudes to controversies which ought to be purely scientific, like for example climate change, are governed by the tribe they belong to, the political tribe they belong to, rather than by the evidence. That's and so right. their attitude to evolution or abortion or something like that is, right. is, is, a, is, a, is a tribal thing. Uh, well, I should have said evolution because that, that's a purely factual matter. Um, that your, your attitude to something purely factual like evolution should be governed by the political tribe to which you belong is a terrible indictment of humanity, really. Yes, and it continues. Yeah. Um, I find it hard to believe. Well, it's a, it's a way of signaling. You, mean, you don't have to know anything about climate change. It's just a way of signaling to your tribe. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm yeah. a, Steve makes the point of, uh, you know, Al Gore's film, in, in Inconvenient Truth was actually a bad thing for climate Counterproductive science. Yeah, because, oh, Al Gore is a liberal and we know the liberals are yes. bad. Yeah. And so then it got affiliated with the political movement rather than just a scientific issue. Yeah. I want to talk about, just for a moment, uh, back to the atheism thing, because I also get this a lot. What do you say to somebody who's dying or a friend that's lost somebody or, you know, it, it, somebody that's going through an existential crisis, uh, you know, I have no meaning in my life. Uh, it, there's this moment in Ricky Gervais's wonderful movie, The Invention of Lying. Have you, have you seen this no, I film? Haven't. It's a great film. He's really funny, but it's, a, it's a, a, a very deep and thoughtful film. So he lives on this, it's, it's a fictional world where everybody always tells the truth. And so he discovers one day, quite by accident, when he goes to the bank, uh, the, the bank teller will just give you however much money you tell them that you have in your account. <laughs> yes. And he mistakenly gives a, too high a, 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 an amount and he, and he assures her that he has that so she gives him the money and, he, and then he checks his account and realizes, oh, I can just say whatever I want. So, of course, you know, the, the, the humor follows quickly from there. He's walking down the street and he sees this beautiful woman. And he says, we have to have sex right now or the world's going to end. <laughs> and she says, do we have time for a hotel room or do we have to do it right here? <laughs> and then there's a bunch of stuff with his buddies and, and so on. But then it kind of turns uh, a little darker where his mother is in, in the hospital and she's dying. And, and she asks him, what's going to happen to me now? And so he, he has that moment like at the bank and he's like, what do I say? Then he makes up this story. Well, in heaven, you're going to heaven. Everybody gets a mansion, a big, beautiful mansion. And, you know, people are there waiting on you and all the food you want. And she's got this glowing smile on her face. And then somebody overhears this in the other room. And the word quickly spreads. Did you hear? We all get a mansion. And, and so pretty soon now, there, there's a throng outside of, the, outside of his house. I haven't seen that, but I haven't seen it. It's there's a throng strange. outside of his house. Uh, you know, tell us about the mansion and what happens. And he's now like Moses. So, and then in a funny moment, he, he had ordered pizza. And he's got two big pizza boxes. So he opens the pizza boxes. The pizza's gone. And he, and he, he writes 10 commands like these are the things 
that we should do. And he comes out there with the two pizza boxes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. What's, it, what's the film called? The Invention of Lying. The Invention of Lying. How have it, I missed really that? Good, yeah. I, it sounds wonderful. Um, but it, it is that question. What do you say to somebody at that moment? It is. Yeah, it is. Um, it's a question of whether you um, betray truth in the interest of comfort and um, in my attitude is I write my books and you can read them if you want but I don't thrust them down your throat and so I'm not going to go into hospital and visit dying patients and say um, <coughs> when you die that's it <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 uh, so um, I, I, I don't have a very good answer to it. Um, there are various euphemisms going around, like you become one with the stars and you go back to, back to the universe right. where, your, where your material came from. Um, I mean, I think I mean, one attitude that I sort of have myself is that there actually is something rather frightening about eternity. Um, I mean, go simply for the, the forever, being dead forever. But also being alive forever is terrifying as well. <laughs> so what's terrifying is eternity. It's, it's not being dead forever. It's being, I mean, it's actually much worse to be alive forever because you would actually experience the eternity. I mean, what a terrifying idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, what you need for something like that is, is a general anesthetic. <laughs> yes. Which is what we're going to have. <laughs> right. Um, so um, I suppose you know, one can use these, was it Mark Twain said, I was dead for billions of years before I was alive and never suffered the smallest inconvenience. All right. Um, um, well, H Hitch made this point about the Christian heaven being like celestial North Korea. Oh, yeah. You know, you have this dictator that knows all your thoughts. Ugh, I don't want somebody to know my thoughts. Yes. And the party you can't leave. And you can't, that's right. You're at the party and you can never leave, right? Yeah, and Julie Sweeney, made, uh, in her wonderful monologue, Letting Go of God, uh, the, that when the Mormon boys come to her door in Hollywood, and they're, they're given the, the pitch about why they, she should join the Mormon religion, and they, get, they give her the whole thing about, uh, you know, the blind will see again, and the deaf will hear again, and the handicap will be made whole again, and she said, well, um, I had uterine cancer. Do I get my uterus back? <laughs> <laughs> and she, they go, yeah. And she goes, I don't want it back. <laughs> and she says, what if you had a nose job and you liked it? <laughs> Do I have to have my own nose back? And then, and then they give her a thing and, and you get to spend eternity with your family. And she went, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the moment you start thinking about yeah, what is up there in heaven? This is the topic of my latest book, the Heavens on Earth. If you just the problem of identity, uh, and 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 turns out Christian religions have debated this. Like, are you physically resurrected up there? This is like the Star Trek transporter problem. What's up there? Because uh, if it's physically you, how old are you? Uh, and so they have to, somebody figured out the answer. It's thirty. You're thirty, because that's the age Jesus was. And it's a good year when you're strong and your memories are still. Well, I'm 64. So what happened to the 34 years in my of my body that's not up there? Uh, okay, no, it's just your soul. But but what's that? It's just a pattern of information that represents my memories. But all my memories, some of the memories, because the memories are not fixed in there. They're always changing. Anyway, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, a. Yeah, it doesn't stand up to serious ratiocination, does it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, so, well, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have to say anything. On the other hand, we could still be intellectually honest, perhaps, and say, I don't know what happens, because we don't know what happens after death. That is strictly true, but yeah, I okay. think. <laughs> I suppose it depends on who's asking. Yeah. Uh, uh, but but on, on a related topic, you must get this as well. What's the point of going on if there's no God or there's no afterlife? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? That oh, comes? that's an easy one. I mean, yeah. you know, how dare you say that? You know, what, what a, you live in this wonderful world. How dare you? Uh, be, how, how much more do you want than, 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 uh, than to, say, to, to say because there is no God, therefore life is, is, is not, not worth living. Okay, just die and make way for somebody else who can appreciate it properly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right.
<laughs> and then where do atheists get their morals? Another one of those. <laughs> well, that really gets back to the shifting moral zeitgeist. Wherever we get them from, it's the same as where everybody else gets them from because we are 21st century people, whether we are religious or not, and in, on the scale of the shifting moral zeitgeist, we have the same morals as other 21st century people and different morals from 19th century people, 16th century people. Um, so we get them from whatever is in the air in our century, in our, in our decade. Uh, religious people may think they get their morals from the Ten Commandments or from the Bible, but they don't. They've never read the Ten Commandments, or if they have, they only remember one of them, which is, thou shalt not kill. Um, they don't remember that the, f the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods but me. The second commandment is, thou shalt make no graven image. Um, I mean, they, they don't know what they're talking about. They think they get their morals from the Bible. Um, and um, nor should they, if you actually read the Bible, <laughs> yes. be an appalling world we live in if we got our morals from, from the Bible. Um, so atheists get their morals from the same place as decent people get their morals, whether they are religious or not. Now you make this point, I think it's in The God Delusion, about you're troubled by it uh, when, when scientists say, when they bump up against one of these questions, well, here we have to hand it off to the theologian. Oh, God, yes. And you make a joke like, why not hand it to the plumber? Yes, exactly <laughs> right, exactly right, yes. I got that from the professor of astronomy at Oxford. And I think, I, actually, it wasn't about morals. It was about the origin of, I don't know, the oh. fundamental laws of nature or something like oh, okay. that. He said, oh, well, here we have to hand over to our good friend, the chaplain. To which I say, why the chaplain? <laughs> Not the gardener or the <laughs> chef. <laughs> As you say, the plumber, yes. But on the other hand, when we talk about, uh, n not where do we get our morals from, but, but, uh, but to what extent can we determine right or wrong or human values using science and reason, most philosophers and scientists will say, well, at this point, we hand it off to the whoever, the utilitarian philosopher, Moral philosophers, the yeah. virtue philosopher, yeah. You know, the Rawlsian philosopher or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and as you know, Sam Harris, myself, a little bit pinker, you know, are kind of pushing for this. Well, no, wait a minute. Scientists yeah. can have something to say about this. How far do you go on this? You, yes. Yeah. You've got to have probably some, I mean, in, in Sam's case, and I think yours, um, you have a kind of axiom that suffering is bad. Yeah. And... Um, it's hard to dispute that, but nevertheless, it is something you have to accept. Well, fundamentally, the bedrock of my moral faith is that suffering is bad, and we should do all we can to avoid suffering among sentient beings, and that can be, get a bit controversial, too. Um, but once you've done that, then everything else really follows from, from by scientific reasoning, by, in which I would include moral philosophic reasoning, which is based on scientific principles, logical principles, in any way. So what, what, once you accept a fundamental axiom like suffering is bad, then you can pretty much do it all by scientific reasoning. I think so, although the critics would counter and say, well, let's move away from the left wall of simplicity to more complicated issues like, uh, should women be, wear a burqa or not? Or female genital mutilation is, a, is, a, is a, an even worse case. Uh, what if the culture there says, this is our culture, and it's none of your business what we do, you Westerners. Uh, you call it suffering, we don't. We call it culture, or mm. the richness of our mm. religion, or whatever. Mm. And even some of the women will say, yes, this is what we'd like to do. H how do you know, I wonder whether any woman has ever really said, I want to be genitally mutilated. Probably not. Yeah. They might be so brainwashed as to, as to think. Th th this is what I worry. So yeah. th there's maybe a couple of criteria. Uh, you know, the, the, the moral, the, the issue that's, that, that's being discussed it, in that culture, is it totally prevalent or are there people that don't want to do it? Uh, and if they say they want to, are they really autonomous volitional beings? It's like, it's like the polygamy question. Shouldn't consenting adults 
do whatever they want or the prostitution question shouldn't women be able to do whatever they want mm. yeah but when when the girls are at seven years old married off they're not autonomous right. agents uh, or drug addicted or whatever um, and, and so there, there, there's some criteria we could use well to there, there's no that. doubt that 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 w when one says that that once you've got the axiom then everything else follows by logical reasoning but moral philosophy is notoriously a pitfall for difficult questions like this the birth right. question is one um, another one is these standard moral philosophic dilemmas like miners trapped underground um, it would cost uh, so and so many dollars to rescue them that money could be spent on feeding starving people right. in, in, in trolley in, in, problems in, yeah yeah um, and the trolley problems um, th these are well recognized problems they're very difficult problems and they arise whether you're religious or not um, but that's not an argument against using scientific principles it's just right. it, it, these are further difficulties which we have to face any, anyway when doing moral philosophy I don't know where you stand we've never discussed abortion I presume you're pro-choice yes as, a, as am I but I, I have to say to pro-lifers who say you're killing a fetus you're killing a potential human life that's right it's also right that you're by refraining from having sexual intercourse you're depriving a human life <laughs> that's true <laughs> so therefore get out there <laughs> that's right um, I mean that there's a they, they, they might counter that by saying ah yes but before before you have sex there is no particular human life that's in existence so you're not you're not actually depriving any the, the particular moment of individual. conception is where they uh, but then you, then you confront them with identical twins and you say okay which of these two twins got the soul right <laughs> and I've never met a Catholic capable of answering that question <laughs> split souls <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, so, I mean, there's no good place to draw the line. A, a counter argument is just is personhood. You're not a legal person, uh, therefore protected by laws and so on, until, uh, until well, now the, in the United States, it's the second trimester. After that, you're a, the start of the third trimester, unless the mother's life is in danger, you are a person, a legal person. So, so somebody recently killed a woman who was pregnant in her third trimester, so it's a double homicide, for example. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not impressed by the need to define something so rigid as personhood. I know lawyers have to do that. Law, it, lawyers insist on drawing lines like that. It seems to me that uh, personhood is something that develops gradually. And a single cell zygote is a tiny step of the way towards personhood. And, and as you go further, you're further and more, more and more. But, but coming back to suffering, What's absolutely clear is that um, to the extent that a fetus can suffer, um, an adult cow or pig can suffer a hell of a lot more. And so you're being totally hypocritical if, yes. you, if, you, uh, uh, if you're passionate against abortion but, but yet kill um, or torture, by, I mean, in slaughterhouses and things. There, there is um, a, a movement within the animal rights movement uh, to make this personhood argument, say, for chimpanzees and gorillas. Yes. Just, just to, as a legal strategy. Yes. Uh, but of course, Peter Singer is the pioneer here uh, on, on this expanding circle idea to include other species. Um, and I have to say, all the arguments for why we should not eat animals that can suffer, I can't counter them. And yet, I had a steak the other night. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and I know you, you've struggled mm. with this, yeah. uh, and, and other people that recognize this do as well. It's hard to get completely on board with that yes um, but, uh, but I think in the case of, 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 of abortion it, it clearly is a, 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 a nonsense to say because this eight cell embryo is human it's therefore special I mean there's, there's, there's absolutely no evolutionary justification for that right um, so uh, you, you, should, you should not use the argument that there's something special about humanity when it's a fetus because it's be, because it's human right and and the evolutionary um counter to that is i think totally watertight at what at what point in the in the evolution of humanity would you would you draw a line don't draw lines they don't right. exist right 
One of my favorite quotes from you is that, uh, I think it was, no homo erectus mother ever gave birth to a homo sapien child. Yes, that's right. I mean, yeah. when you tell people that, they're like, well, what? Then yes. how did it yeah. ever come about? Yes. I met a lawyer once who said, um, isn't this a watertight argument against evolution? Um, every, uh, every child born, let me think, how did it go? Um, uh, yes. If you go back in, in, in evolution, there has to be a point where um, our, our ancestors were of, of, of a different species, and yet we're told that species can't reproduce with um, other, other species. Isn't that a watertight argument against evolution? Doesn't that prove that evolution never happened? To which the answer is, you reach voting age, you, you, you can vote at the age of 18. Um, doesn't that prove that Development never, never happens because... <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good argument. Well, Richard, we've been going a little over an hour, and uh, we are instructed to leave uh, uh, time for some Q&A. So uh, I, I don't know if we have a microphone or how you want to do it. Uh, he says thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Could we have the lights up in the house okay. so we can see? Okay. So, uh, th uh, first, thank you very much, uh, dear Michael and dear Richard, for this interesting and entertaining talk. So, we have now the opportunity uh, for the audience uh, to ask some questions. So, we have a microphone from my point of view on the right side and on the left side, so you can line up. We can't see a thing. Can is it possible to have the lights up? To have the house uh, lights up. Can, can das Licht ein bisschen mehr um, hier oben ein bisschen mehr runtergefahren yeah, there's, there's werden? There's a mic over there and a mic over there. So, I think they want to line up. There's a microphone. Es gibt Microphone, Mikrofone hier rechts und links. Think, so, I dort bitte anstellen. Uh, and I have to apologize uh, if we cannot we cannot have all questions answered. I think I think they Maybe want yeah. because we have only a limited time. <laughs> I, I would say 30 minutes for for Q and A. Um, okay. Well, while they're working yeah, on the house, that's 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 well. the lighting uh, in the audience. Can, yeah. So <laughs> that looks good. So we are fine with the questions. Anna, mal abwechseln. So one on the right, one on the red side. So we will start here on the right side, and then the next on the left side. So I. So please, and only questions, no statements. So. And uh, um, when you you can address uh, Michael Schirmer and or Richard Dawkins for the question. So please start here on the right side. And uh, go on. Can you hear me all right? Okay, and please, uh, if possible, uh, in English language. <laughs> um, on the question of convergent uh, evolution, uh, you said that it's possible that any uh, species intelligent enough to produce radio waves, strong enough to be heard from outside, um, would soon be able to destroy themselves somehow. Um, could one of those possibilities also be AI? Um, because neural networks uh, work very similarly than, or similar to evolution, but are much faster and much more efficient. And even now, we already have AI that is smarter and better at doing stuff than we are. Um, could we expect in 100 years or so to be so obsolete in our <laughs> Uh, current system that we might as well just say, okay, AI, you take over. We, don't, we are necessary anymore. Um, there's a very interesting book by, uh, am I, is my mic still on? Yep, you're right. Um, uh, Max Tegmark, I think it is, um, suggesting that uh, AI um, could um, take off to such a rapid extent that, um, as you suggest, we, we could indeed be completely left behind. and. Um, uh, however, that, that would not be a destruction in the same way as, say, a um, nuclear war would, because 
the, the AI that would be our legacy, would be our successors, would be presumably as capable or, or even more capable of broadcasting um, signals that SETI could pick up. So that would not be an example of the short-livedness of a, of, of a civilization. That, that would have to come from something more destructive. Admittedly, the AI might destroy us, which might be a good thing, uh, <laughs> but, um, it, but it would not destroy the capacity to communicate with the rest of the universe. Yeah, uh, Teg Mark's book is Life 2.0. It, it, it's a good read. I'm an AI optimist. I, I, I'm not worried about it. I don't think it, the disaster is coming. It, it, in a way, Pinker makes this uh, point, actually. It's sort of self-refuting that when, when you press for examples, like, well, we'll instruct this AI machine to make paper clips. And it's going to turn, it, after it uses up all the material it has, it's going to consume the chair and me and you and all humans, the room, the rest of the whole planet will be paper clips. So this machine is, uh, is so smart, it can, it can do this, but so dumb, it has no idea what we mean by paper clips and where to stop. Uh, and, and, and you can apply that to pretty much any example. Like I programmed my car to take me to LAX like I did the other day. And, uh, and, and, and to get me there in the shortest route possible, it goes up on sidewalks and plows through pedestrians. <laughs> like, like Elon is gonna actually not figure out with his engineers that you're not supposed to do that or the you know, government regulators are not gonna prevent that from happening before it gets to the point where AI can cause our own extinction. So I, I don't think it's gonna happen. So, from yeah. the left side, from my point of view. Yeah, as a person comes from the Middle East out of a war, um, I have a question of the future of science and um, weapon uh, development and inventions, and the moral side of life-saving suffer, suffer reduction, and, um, and another part, the, the, the the end of poverty, so um, how can science help that in, in the future of humanity? So, what was the question I didn't know? So, um, the, in, in the moral why, in the moral side of science, how would it help with the uh, weapon productions? Weapon. A oh, weapons production science, right. Hmm. Yeah, I think this is the a question about how science and technology, like the AI question, can, 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 can be used for immoral means. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like the yeah, bomb. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, but of course, the technologies are used by governments or people, mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not themselves. They don't do this by themselves. Uh, so I, I, it's not the kind of thing I think scientists have to worry about by themselves, but the ethical aspects of the use of science, which is why Oppenheimer and the rest, so, uh, you know, you had second thoughts after Hiroshima, yes. like maybe we shouldn't have done this. I, I, I think the way I put it is that if you want to do good things, then science is the way to do it. If you want to do bad things, science is the way to do it as well. So science provides the tools, it's the best possible tools to do whatever governments, whatever politicians, whatever uh, society wants to do. And so if you want to do bad things, then then you use scientific means to, to, to do it. Um, whether scientists have an additional responsibility to refuse uh, is another matter and is, uh, is certainly arguable. And um, it might even have happened, I, th I think. I mean, I, I dare say there, there are scientists who refuse to work on, on weapons systems. Um, I think it's been suggested that uh, in, the, in the Second World War, um, the reason why Germany did not develop an atomic bomb was that Heisenberg, I mean, the, the official reason is that Heisenberg miscalculated. But, but the interesting question is whether he deliberately mis miscalculated as a, as, a, as a moral act. And I'm not sure that's ever been settled. Maybe it has. Yeah, the problem, like back to the AI, AI question, the use of artificial intelligence, the internet, whatever, by rogue states and terrorists and so on, that's the problem. It's not the technology, it's the people. Uh, and so to get to nuclear zero is gonna be very difficult because of the other guy problem. I'll give up my nukes if you do, but he says, well, I'm not going to until you do, and you end up in this, so now we have nine nuclear states. 
So the, the, the money spent that we spend on building these weapons should be spent on game theory analysis or <laughs> diplomacy or social science or you know, how to get people that are in conflict to, to talk to each other so that they don't want to do that. Anyway, that's, but that's a harder problem. Okay, next question on the right side. Take the microphone, I guess. Uh, good evening. First off, I wanted to thank you uh, a lot for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, you mentioned Jordan Peterson earlier, and he's been gaining a lot of popularity. Um, he talks a lot about values, like intrinsic archetypical values, and they conveniently happen to be Christian values. So my question would be if atheism or secular societies have failed to deliver a compelling narrative for people that they can like grasp on. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. So, um, yeah, I know Jordan. Um, and I think what the appeal is, uh, you can go on skeptic.com and read my explanation for the phenomenon. I, I, I think the appeal is more of self-help. Uh, you know, people feel like not that they don't have the right Christian values. They go to him for the same reason they go to, say, Tony Robbins, who's a, a huge, literally huge, he's like 6'4", but he's very popular. And you know, uh, there's a Netflix film called I'm Not Your Guru, in which it shows Tony Robbins is very much everybody's guru. And, and, it, and it, it has nothing to do with Christian values. He's just talking about, like Jordan, Stand up straight, make your room, you know, work out every day, eat white, and because the world is a dangerous, harsh place, and people aren't nice, and so you gotta be strong, something like that. I think that's the appeal. Where, in my opinion, and that of uh, uh, others that have studied him, uh, he gets a little murky on the, you know, did the resurrection happen? Well, what do you mean by the resurrection? Uh, do you mean suffering for your sins or, or like you ask him, do you believe, if you ask me, do you believe in God? The answer is no. If you ask Jordan, Jordan, do you believe in God? It would take me 40 hours to answer that question. <laughs> All right, if it takes you 40 hours to answer, then you know, you're talking about something completely different. And there he gets into Jung and Freud and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and all that stuff. And again, that's, it's okay to say novelists have tapped into deep truths about human nature. That's true. I mean, the reason Shakespeare and Jane Austen and so on are popular novelists is because they're saying something deep that we all kind of get. Like, that, that's true, these power struggles and, uh, and, and sexual infidelities and all, all this stuff. Yeah, they've tapped into that before psychology, cognitive sci scientists started studying it. But, but, to, but to then, and here's where he gets fuzzy, then he makes the transition from that to like a scientific truth. It's like, no, no, wait. It's okay to say it's, a metaphorically, it's metaphorically true or the novelist making up the story or tapping into something that's true, but, but, but the story's not true. <laughs> and, and, and there he gets a little murky that makes people nervous, like me. <laughs> okay, the next question on the left side. Uh, Professor Dokken, you said um, living forever is rather frightening. I wonder, and this question is for both, would you consider or encourage the use of life extension technologies to prolong your life through science? Well, I, I might go for 200 years, but that's about <laughs> my limit. <laughs> yeah, my answer is, you know, because I, again, I just wrote that book, Heavens on Earth. So I interviewed all these people, talked to these people. Shermer, don't you want to live to be 500 or 1,000 years? I go, look, just get me to 80 without prostate cancer. Get me to 90 without Alzheimer's. Get me to 100 where I'm not in a bed plugged in. Just incremental, so we call this protopia, not utopia, protopia. Just a little bit better every day. And don't worry about the, you know, the takeoff point 500 years from now, we get to live forever, something like that. Um, and if along the way these longevity, there's a lot of money, startup money in this, in Silicon Valley for these longevity life extension technologies, to which I say great, because along the way they're gonna have to solve cancer problems, the Alzheimer's, senility, dementia problems, uh, and that would be good. And again, don't worry about the, far just tomorrow. Okay, next question from the right side. 
Uh, so we heard uh, Michael talk about Jordan Peterson. I wanted to ask Richard if you have an opinion, uh, an opinion on him as well, and if you plan on debate, uh, debating him in the future. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that at all. Jordan Peterson, is that what you said? Yes, exactly. I wanted to he wants to know your opinion, uh, Jordan Peterson. Opinion. Oh, and God. if you plan on debating <laughs> him. <laughs> or not, God. I'm just aware that every time I look at the internet, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson. Um, no, I don't have an opinion. Um, <laughs> no. Why should I have an opinion? Okay, next to the I gather I, 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 I gather he objects to being forced by the Canadian by Canadian law to use pronouns that people want him to use and on, on that I'm thoroughly in his favour. Good for him. Uh, yeah, my question was to Jordan Peterson related, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I just find it weird that you don't have an opinion on him, because <laughs> your teachings or what you usually say is, would be contrary. Yeah. I never offer an opinion on something of which I'm ignorant. Yes. Here, here. <laughs> So, uh, so I am a big. Uh, I'm very big on uh, moving towards progressively moving towards a global culture, uh, and I often do these thought experiments how we can very constructively move towards a more global culture where we are interacting more uh, with each other. And uh, often the problem that comes to my head is uh, like the tribal instinct in my head uh, feels a bit. Uh, uh, cringes a bit when it thinks about, uh, okay, so we are going to lose out on certain languages, we are going to dilute a lot of cultural things. Some of them, of course, are bad, they will be weeded out, but the, a lot of good stuff will also get weeded out. And, and somehow I feel that this tribal instinct is getting tapped in a very negative way, and a lot of the problems around in the world is due to this tribal instinct. So how do you see a conceivable constructive way towards future where we still go towards a global direction, but still placate the tribal instinct that we have within us. So the problem is the reconciling of tribalism with globalism? Yes, right. right. Well, well, part of it is, first you break down economic barriers. So you allow free trade, then people exchange and they realize you're not a bad person or whatever. G getting political borders to be more porous, I think is, Going to be more, is going to be harder because of you know, language and other tribal defining characteristics, something like that. Yeah. I do think tribalism is one of the great evils, actually, one of the things we really need to, to work on, to, to try to... Re and I think we all suffer from it to some extent and need to purge ourselves of it. Yes. There's a great um, documentary film, a PBS film, on Jane Elliott, the third grade teacher in... I think 1968, uh, came into her class one day, so these are third graders, uh, and she says, well, you know, we're gonna divide the room today into the blue-eyed people and the brown-eyed people. And now we've all you're, all, you're probably all familiar with the study, but you have to watch the film of how effective she is at making the, the prejudices happen within minutes of how quickly you know, because then, then one of the brown-eyed students says something and she says, you see, blue-eyed kids, that's just the kind of thing a brown-eyed person would say, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And they're like, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they do a follow-up, which I was not aware of, that she did, I don't know, maybe a decade later uh, with a, uh, a group of prison staffers, so guards and administrators or whatever. And she did the same kind of thing, same thing with them, brown, the brown-eyed people and the blue-eyed people. And she started dividing them up, and they fell right into it like the third graders, like within minutes. You know, one of them didn't have the clipboard right. You know, that's just the kind of thing a brown-eyed person would do with a clipboard, see? Yes. And, yeah. uh, and they were like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah. Typical Taurus or typical yes. Yes. Yeah. Libra. Yeah. Libra, uh, <laughs> right. Um, I think another similar experiment was, perhaps you know this better than me, Michael, um, Dividing children up, giving them at random either green T-shirts or orange T-shirts. It's say. the same kind of thing, yeah. Same kind of thing. And I, I imagine extending that um, experiment for a couple of hundred years when you have a rule that children uh, with gr 
orange T-shirts have to grow up and marry other orange children, <laughs> and green children have to marry other green children, and they're and then they yes, then they have children of their own who have, have to wear the same T-shirt, and they go to either orange schools or green schools, and that goes on for 200, 300 years. And what have you got, Northern Ireland? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is leading very well to, to the question that I have. Uh, you were mentioning the, the nuns. Uh, you were mentioning the tribalism, the nationalism that is rising up again. In our societies, we can, we can see a lot of Muslim people who somehow cling very much to, their, to their, uh, the belief of their forefathers, let's say. And uh, I am uh, thinking if all of this is also very much a sign of a need for an identity in a world yeah. where we can really choose pretty much what we want to do. And I'm thinking if uh, the secularism is lacking somewhat, this identity, and does it make hard for people to, uh, yeah, to commit themselves on secularism because they feel like it's some, somehow it's nothing or something? And uh, you, Mr. Dawkins, you have been inventing this A for atheist, which is somehow, I see it as a proposal somehow to, to give an, a little bit of an identity to this new atheism or something. But so my question would be, should we put more effort into, uh, I don't know, or is it, is it like trying to install a new tribe? Uh, What about this uh, secular identity? I should like to think that we don't need to do that, but unfortunately, it, it may be that we do, and, and I'm impressed, as I think we said earlier, by the, the fact that people do show such astonishing loyalty to their tribe, even with respect to um, scientific beliefs. And so I would like not to need to do that. I would like to say, here is the evidence. This is... This is What, what, what the evidence shows, this, this, this is therefore, you know, take it or leave it. But if, if we really do have to wear a uniform, if we really have to sort of wear a sort of funny hat to show we're atheists or something, I, I would not wish to be a part of that. Or wear the skeptic pin. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, I, you're, you're, you're right, we have this red, red A as a, as a, as a badge. Um, and I, I, I quite like it when somebody comes into a book signing queue wearing a a t-shirt that I made up like religion, together we can find the cure, um, <laughs> um, which, which, which I see occasionally. Um, and, and, but but, but I, I, I would like to think we can do that without, we can do it with the evidence, we can do it by reason, without the need to wear a uniform, without the need to go to church every Sunday and, and band together as a, as a group. But maybe not an atheist identity, maybe a humanist identity, which is why yeah. you know, the late Paul Kurtz wanted to build a, a humanist building in every city in the world. Yes. A place to go where you can hang out with like-minded people that's for something. We're for civil rights and civil liberties and yeah. free speech. And not, not just we're against this, we're for these things over here. And uh, you know, you've probably spoken at many of these universalist Unitarian churches and the, the same kind of thing they don't really believe in god and they like candles and they sing hymns to newton and they they have testimonials about how they lost their religion and i don't i don't really enjoy these because i don't feel a need to go to church i never liked that part of religion but obviously some people do yeah uh, they like the sunday service uh without the god well maybe we can have meetings like this lecture <laughs> right right Okay, next question. So my question is about the discussion of uh, moral object objectivity. So you mentioned earlier uh, this uh, sort of moral maxim or moral axiom that all you need to, to start, to kickstart a discussion about the existence of objective moral values or how we ought to behave morally is to understand that suffering is wrong and sentient creatures can suffer and therefore that's wrong. So that does a lot of work for a person like me. But I find myself often at an impasse when I argue with people that have a different conception of objective morality. Because it seems that they, for, by that they understand 
that a situation in which we have a universe that is only made out of stars and rocky planets, no sentient beings whatsoever, still has some sort of moral code there embedded in it. And they understand that as the only way in which you can understand moral objective values. So I'm wondering, how can I argue with such people to say that it's subjective enough to say that suffering is wrong and if there are sentient creatures, that's all you need to kickstart and build an objective morality, but they just don't take that as objective enough. Yeah, I think, um, I think what, okay, there's a couple of threads here. So first of all, if, if you're Tom Hanks uh, 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 stranded on that island, there's no moral issues. It's just you're just by yourself. There's no other sentient beings that can be affected by your action. So morality is not even part of the equation, I think. Uh, as for it be, being built in the universe, not the universe, uh, but, but in the sentient beings in the universe, there's morality in the sense that if you just think about what's the purpose of a star, the star's purpose is to convert hydrogen into helium. That's what it does. Uh, what's the purpose of mountains? They're, they're to grow and erode and, and so on. There's, so there's purposes in nature. And it, so what's the purpose of humans? Well, read the selfish gene and, and you'll, you'll build from there. But at some point, we're interacting with other social beings. And how you interact with them then becomes moral or immoral. And, and that's when it begins. The, objectiv the hard part about the objectivity is how that word is used. Like we're going to stand outside of humans and find here is where we know abortion is wrong or, or it's okay, whatever the issue is. You can't because it's, it's a human thing. So within human nature, we have certain impulses that we can discover through science that tell us what humans need. What do we want? We don't want to suffer. And you start there. Now, the, the critic would say that's not objective knowledge. You're just asking people, you know, would you like to suffer? No, that's not objective knowledge. I think it is, but you know, there you go. Anyway. So, okay. um, first of all, thank you both for, for the great discussion tonight. Um, looks like three people already asked my question, so I'm, I'm going to ask it from a different angle. So, Professor Dawkins, please you not said Jordan that Peterson. you... Please yes, not Jordan Peterson. unfortunately, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> so, you said you have no opinion about him. It looks like, oh, no. it's, looks like <laughs> no, he does Jordan an opinion Peterson. about you. There is a video of him saying that he thinks atheists like Richard Dawkins should be, uh, should be oppressed, for starters. And number two, um, Michael, I've read your article, I've read uh, Stephen in Banker's article on, on Skeptic Magazine, I've seen your, I've listened to all the podcasts with Sam Harris, etc. The trouble is that people like uh, Peterson are uh, filling up the void that was created with millennials and Gen Z uh, by not believing in gods. And, and he is gr he, he's, he's big with uh, Gen Z in his advocacy of the, of the Christian God, of the Bible, his twisted um, relationship with, uh, with reality and truth. And in your time, Michael, you have debunked people like Chopra and others, but you didn't quite push back uh, in your discussions with, uh, with Peterson. My question is why? Well, because again, it, it depends which claim is he making that I'm going to push back on. There's parts of Deepak's that I don't push back on when he says, you know, meditation is good. Okay, yeah, it probably is. Not for me, but other people, okay, fine. But then when he gets into the quantum consciousness woo-woo, then I push back. So again, I'm happy to push back. I did in my article on Peterson about his theory of truth, the archetypal theory of truth, which is very close to Ronald Hoffman's uh, interface theory of truth. Hoffman, he's a cognitive psychologist at uh, UC Irvine who has this interface theory of truth that the brain is like, um, well, sort of like a laptop screen and these icons are floating around on there. They don't really exist in the brain. They're just, they're just our perceptual icons. So all of the, what we perceive in, in nature isn't real. They're just icons because our senses are just converting photons of light into neural impulses, for example. So it's, then, then you can go, he doesn't quite go so far as say solipsism or something like that. But, but I push back on that and, and, and Jordan's theory of truth is very similar to that, which I think is incorrect. And, and I said so, and, and you know, if, if you've got four or five hours uh, to drive, listen to the Sam Harris podcast, I both did, of as them. A, as, yeah. a, as a matter of fact, And yeah. you know, it's, it's just uh, painful to listen to. It is. Uh, 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 yeah, there was a Star Trek episode where uh, Captain Picard is captured and being tortured. And the four torture will lights, stop yeah. if he'll mm -hmm. say, there are five bright lights here. 
even though there's four. And he keeps saying, there's four. And it, it, they crank up the pain. And so finally, he's rescued. And back at the ship, he tells the ship's counselor, Troy, you know, I came to believe there were five. That was my truth. And I almost said it. But there were really just four. <laughs> he's just wrong. All right. So anyway, that's my critique. Of that's straight from 1984. When, when Winston... Oh, yes, yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they stole that. That's they right. They stole it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's only seven plots in Hollywood. <laughs> they just recycle them all. <laughs> okay. Next is Ajit. I think, mm, thank you. Um, so on the subject of tribalism and uh, uh, the future of humankind, um, bearing a highly improbable alien invasion, what do you think, in your opinion, will take for humans to... Um, to kind of abolish this sense of tribalism and, and kind of like extrapolate it to the whole planet, to the whole human race. So you're suggesting that if we were invaded by aliens, we would become one tribe? Yeah. There are, there are precedents for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, uh, it's an area of cognitive science, uh, what's called debiasing or deprogramming people, uh, where like, what's the best way to get a climate denier to accept the science, okay? It, it turns out it's not just throw the facts right there in front of them and then you'll go, oh, I see. No, you have to, like in the previous example, you have to say this is not a left-wing, right-wing issue it, you know, and you have to take the politics out of it. You can keep your belief in free markets and unfettered capitalism, you can have all that, but here's this other issue here, I just wanna get you there. Or you can keep your Jesus, but evolution happened anyway, whatever. If, but if you, if you give somebody a choice, like. The choice between Jesus and Darwin, if they're believers, they're, they're not gonna accept Darwin, right? So, so the, the, the idea is to figure out what it is they're really signaling when they say, I believe this, and then, and then, and then go after that. There's research on, you know, like teaching students, like what's the best way to get them to you know, accept critical thinking principles or something like that. And uh, anyway, you can, Pinker has a nice chapter on this in, I think it's in Enlightenment Now. Uh, summarizing the research on debiasing, deprogramming. First of all, you can tell people about the confirmation bias, the hindsight bias, and so on. Unfortunately, there's another bias, the bias that I can now recognize the cognitive biases in everybody <laughs> else. Fortunately, I'm not subject to those. Yeah. <laughs> Self-serving bias. <laughs> okay, because I do. Um, so uh, I have two very brief questions. The first is that in the United States, an atheist cannot become president, no matter what good of a politician they are. Do you think that that will perhaps ever change? I think and it already changed. I think we have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. <laughs> and the second is that, uh, more rather directed to Professor Dawkins, you said earlier that uh, modern mor morality is a product of change in society, and I totally approve. But isn't there another second huge aspect uh, on the origin of morality, which could be derived from perhaps uh, altruistic genes or group solidarity behavior, which can be observed in a uh, chimpanzee? I think it's true that, uh, that there are evolutionary roots to morality, which you can trace in um, both from ethological studies of chimpanzees and other mammals, and, and also from uh, Darwinian theory, uh, but that um, that's just the basis of it, and then culture comes along and builds upon that, and, uh, and it's that that's subject to the changing moral zeitgeist. But you're absolutely right that, 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 that there is uh, an evolutionary basis which, which we, we can call upon when trying to understand morality. Yes, I agree. Thank you. One of my favorite lines from The Selfish Gene is uh, that the difference between a rock and, another, and, a, and an organism is the rock doesn't kick back if you kick it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah. that, it begins yeah. right there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm afraid if we take all these questions, it would take another 30 minutes, and it's uh, a little bit too long. So I would propose two questions from this side and two questions from that side. And uh, then we have a book signing. So. The next question here. Mr. Dawkins, uh, you alluded earlier to the very political nature of um, the processes that govern um, which domains uh, of science or which 
exact scientific facts we rely upon when formulating arguments or building our world view. World view. Um, surely the um, race differences in IQ um, are known to you. And aside from Sam Harris, I'm not aware of anyone uh, on the left side of the political spectrum uh, who really addresses this I issue. Um, and of course, it is then um, capitalized on by the right wing. Um, you surely know that, for example, uh, Ashkenazi Jews or other European eth uh, ethnic groups uh, score about one standard deviation above the mean, which is 100, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but unfortunately, on the other end of the, of the bell curve, we have uh, some um, African tribal groups who only uh, score, I think, about 60, which is uh, unfortunately reported by independent researchers since um, pretty much the first IQ tests were um, well um, taken there. Uh, so what do you uh, make of it that only the right, um, if any people at all, addresses this qu uh, question? I am afraid I, I was ignorant of the facts that you, that you quote, and probably um, I, 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 I was aware that um, an astonishingly high number of Nobel Prizes in science have been won by people of uh, Jewish cultural heritage. Um, I, it's very difficult to decide when you have figures like that to what extent these might be of genetic origin, to what extent they might be of cultural origin. There are such huge cultural differences between the groups that you, that you mention. Um, I, so I, I mean, certainly in the case of the Flynn effect itself, the increase in IQ over um, the 20th century, over decades, um, that happens too fast to be a genetic evolutionary effect, even if that one could imagine a selective pressure in favor of it. So that, at least that shows that we can get dramatic differences in IQ, which are of non-genetic origin. Um, and um, that would make me tend to be suspicious of the suggestion that um, the differences that you describe are of genetic origin. But I think scientists should always be open-minded to such possibilities, and we should not automatically reject a hypothesis simply because it's politically or so socially undesirable. I should point out that... Yeah, <laughs> the comment that only right-wing people uh, point out the uh, racial differences in IQ and, 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 and liberals don't. All of this research is conducted by professional cognitive scientists and, so, and psychologists published in peer-reviewed journals and so on. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. They're all academics. They all teach at universities. And we know from studies of uh, the political persuasion of professors in the social sciences, it's about 80% liberal. So although I've never seen a study asking people who study IQ who they voted for or who they donated to, or what their political self-identification is, it's very likely the vast majority of people that study IQ that record and report those differences are liberals. Now maybe they don't wanna go on a podcast and, and with Charles Murray and talk about it because Murray has kind of made it a right-wing thing to say, but the vast majority I'm quite sure are not right-wing. It's okay, isn't question have a lesson, please a brief question, maybe if possible, without a long introduction. <laughs> All right, so uh, on Jordan Peterson? No. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm joking, oh I'm joking. All right. Um, He's joking, he's joking. Yeah, I'm joking. So, so earlier you talked about how humanity is getting better. And the, th the thing is, uh, around the Western Hemisphere, we see that um, encroachments on uh, freedoms, especially freedom of speech and uh, introductions of blasphemy laws and all of that. So my question to both of you would be, uh, how do you factor this in with what you said about humanity constantly getting better? And the other thing is, 
arguments pro-freedom have already been made, like by Voltaire, John Stuart Mill and all of that. Why is that forgotten and how can we reintroduce people to those ideas? Thank you. Well, I think the, the, the short answer is, as I said, three steps forward, two steps back. It's not a, a perfect, smooth, linear curve going upwards. And by the way, there's no there to get, there's no there there to get to. It's an asymptotic curve like this. It's, we're always going to have to work at it. Uh, John Stuart Mill is still pop popular in college courses. Uh, his 1859 On Liberty uh, has just been reprinted by the Heterodox Academy uh, under d d just portions of the book. Um, it's titled All Minus One. All Minus One, it's free. You can download it at the Heterodox Academy website. Um, and it's beautifully illustrated and it's the central points of you know, why we should listen to what other people have to say. Uh, based on Mill's famous, you know, if, if All Minus One believed one thing, we should still listen to that one person. We might, be wrong, we might be partially wrong, we might be completely wrong. Even if we're right, we'll learn more about our arguments and make them better. He who knows his own, only his own side of the argument doesn't even know that. You gotta know what the other side's arguing and steel man or articulate their argument as, as good as they would or even better to the point where they would say, yes, that is exactly what I believe. And then you can demolish it. Anyway, that's, so I think it's, it's still out there. We just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing back against those forces. They'll always be there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, the last question from this side, the last question. Okay. okay um, for a long time, uh, religions have tried to basically portray it as an allegory with the truths being more read between the lines and they don't, and lately it's not even required that you actually believe in a God. Uh, the truths can be found by everyone and m oftentimes this has been criticized in the, as playing, uh, giving false legitimacy to religion and thereby extremism can foster more easily. But I've recently heard a point made that this actu these attempts are actually quite good for uh, the decline of religion because, uh, for example, the Anglican Church has been have uh, declining numbers or since the 1980s and it has been very uh, quickly de uh, declining, in, uh, in fact, while other denominations have stayed pretty constant throughout the years. So maybe this attempt to make religion more intellectually flattering uh, makes it ha have no selling value anymore and for the public and actually this is good for the decline of religion. What are your thoughts on this second point? Yeah. Uh, if, if... I'm not sure there was a question what, there, but... No, uh, it, whether or not uh, this, this attempt to make religions, religions more intellectual have uh, negative effects, more negative effects like fostering extremism, or uh, they actually help the decline of religion? As yes, so, in so you mean that sophisticated theologians who sort of waffle yeah, exactly. in, in a semi-incomprehensible way yeah. are killing their own church more effectively. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we should be more welcoming of those kinds of people. Yeah. There's probably something in that, I think. Um, and it, it, it's a remarkable fact that some of the most doctrinaire religions seem to be the ones that command loyalty. I mean, religions that spout palpable nonsense seem to be the ones that, that people remain loyal to. Um, and or not only spout palpable nonsense, but also demand extremely uncomfortable rituals and discipline and uh, forcing people to undergo unpleasant sacrifices and things like that. It's as though people almost like to be tortured in this kind of way. Um, and I've, it's always puzzled me, but I think maybe you've got a point. And um, any, anything that leads to the decline of religion is okay by me. <laughs> I I rather like the idea of, uh, 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 almost like the idea of mandatory religious education of children. All of the religions, including oh, yeah. Scientology, Mormonism, all the crazy yeah, stuff. All, all for that. Yeah. As Dan Dennett said, the best way to get rid of religion is to make people read the Bible. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>
Okay, you see, last question from this side, last question at all? Uh, no, there should be another question from the other side. It was, it was four. He, but he asks his, this last question from this side, and you have the last I'm question sorry. at all. Okay. Um, well, good evening. Um, thank you for coming to Berlin. My question is kind of hard to phrase. I hope I get it right. There is a, a school of thought that is basically nihilism sitting on the top of um, science as evolutionary biology and uh, physics. And that school of thought basically says that um, the universe is deterministic, so there is no uh, free will is just an illusion. Um, it says that consciousness and feelings are nothing but an illusion either, because they're nothing but um, arbitrarily evolved uh, neurochemical reactions. Uh, I don't know if you both subscribe to that school of thought. However, I think it, it, it must be understandable when people feel aggravated when they hear it. Um, because it basically, if you forgive the phrase, it invalidates their existence. And it says that the love that you have for your children and so forth is nothing but an illusion. Uh, do you think that is a problem? And what do you make of it? I was always taught by an Oxford tutor effect effectively to reach for my revolver when I hear the phrase nothing but. <laughs> um, nothing but an illusion. It may be an illusion, but it's a wonderful illusion. And <laughs> consciousness may be an illusion, free will may be an illusion, but it's a very powerful illusion. It's one that we all have, and it's one of, it's one of the things that makes life worth living. Here it is. <laughs> Could I, could, I, could I say something before we break for the uh, book signing? And I, I haven't actually talked to Michael about this. Um, I often, when it's a large audience as this is, and there's potentially therefore a rather large line queue for signing books, um, I feel it's unfair on people at the end of the line if we spend a lot of time dedicating books to particular individuals um, at the beginning of the line. And so I have always tried to make it a rule not to dedicate books personally when it's in a, a long line. I do it pr privately, but, but and ditto with, with selfies. I wish I'd remember to ask Michael well, how you feel about this. Uh, I, I don't care, we'll see how, how it goes. <laughs> well, that, that leaves it open. Okay, okay. no okay. selfies at all. Yo, thank you again. Uh, I'll follow your lead on that. Uh, Michael and Richards. Thank you. And thank you. Thank, thank you, you for the thank audience. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Really good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.